reading through the Bible in one year, February 15th, Genesis 48, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80, Job 14, and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Sometime after this, Joseph was told, your father is weaker. So he set out with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Jacob was told, your, jo your, rather, your son, your Joseph, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make many nations come from you and will give this land as a permanent possession to your future dependents. Descendants. It's tax season. <laughs> your two sons born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are now mine. He just, yoink, took them. Manasseh and Ephraim belong to me just as Reuben and Simeon do. Children born to you after them will be yours and will be recorded under the names of their brothers with regard to their inheritance. When I was returning from Paddan, to, to my sorrow, Rachel died along the way, some distance from Ephrath in uh, the land of Canaan. I buried her there along the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, These are my sons God has given me here. So Israel said, Bring them here to me, and I will bless them. Now his eyesight was poor because of old age, and he could hardly see. And Joseph brought them to him, and he kissed him and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, but now God has even let me see your offspring. Then Joseph took them from his father's knees and bowed with his face to the ground. Then Joseph took them both with his right hand on Ephraim and his uh, toward Israel's left and his left hand toward Manasseh with is sorry toward Israel's right and brought them to Israel. But Israel stretched out his right hand and put it on the head of Ephraim the younger and crossing his hands put his left on Manasseh's head although Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, "The God before whom my fathers um Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm. May he bless these boys, and may they be called by my name, and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may grow, rather may they grow to be numerous within the land. When Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, he thought it was a mistake and took his father hand, er, father's hand to Move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's. And Joseph said to his father, Not that way, my father. This one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. Again, following the, the way that God has chosen over time. I know, my son, I know. He too will become a tribe, and he too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his offspring will become a populous nation. So he blessed them that day, putting Ephraim before Manasseh, and said, The nation Israel will invoke blessings by you, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Israel said to Joseph, Look, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your fathers. Over and above what I am giving your brothers, I am giving you uh, the mountain slope that I took from the Amorites with my sword and bow. And that is all of the notes. Let's move on to Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside her leapt, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the, my, 
Blah, 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 blah. The baby leapt for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on the humble estate, the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. And he has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with her about three months, and then she returned to her home. Now, the time had come for Elizabeth, for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her his great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. When the time came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother responded, no, 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 he will be called John. Then they said to her, why? None of your relatives has that name. So they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. Basically, to fix this, right? And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. They were all amazed. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was set free. And he began to speak, praising God. And fear came on all those who lived around them. And all these things were being talked about. Uh, throughout the hill, the hill country of Judea, all who heard about him uh, took it to heart, saying, What then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, just as he spoke by mouth of his, rather, by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He has dealt mercifully with our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham. He has given us the privilege since we have been rescued from the hand of our enemies to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness and his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give, the, his, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew up and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And that is all the notes to there. Let's move on to Job 14. Job continues his, his reply to his friends, air quotes, friends. Anyone born of woman is, is short of days and full of trouble. He blossoms like a flower, then withers. He flees like a shadow and does not last. Do you really take notice of, of one like this? Will you bring me into judgment against you? Again, he's talking to God. Who can produce something pure from what is impure? No one. Since a person's days are determined and the number of his months depends on you, and since you have set limits that he cannot pass, look away from him and let him rest so that he can enjoy his day like a hired worker. There, there's hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it'll sprout again, and its shoots will not die. 
If its roots grow old in the ground and its stump starts to die in the soil, the scent of water will make it thrive and produce twigs like a sapling. But a person? A person dies and fades away. He breathes his last. Where is he? As water disappears from a lake and, and a river becomes parched and dry, so people lie down never to arise again. They will not wake up until the heavens are no more. They will not stir from their sleep. If only you would hide me in Sheol, again the place of the dead, and conceal me until your anger passes. If only you would appoint a time for me and then remember me. But when a person dies... Will he come back to life? If so, I, I, I would wait all the days of my struggle until my relief comes. You, you would call, and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands, for then you would count my steps, but, but would not take note of my sin. My rebellion would be sealed up in a bag, and you would cover over my iniquity. But as a mountain collapses and crumbles and a rock is dislodged from its place, as water wears away stones and torrents wash away the soil from the land, so you destroy a man's hope. You completely overpower him and he passes on. You change his appearance and send him away. If his sons receive honor, he does not know it. If they become insignificant, he is unaware of it. He feels only the pain of his own body and mourns only for himself. Again, he's wrapping this up saying that he doesn't think that he's done anything wrong. He's stated that in, the, uh, in chapter uh, 12. <laughs> um, he reiterated that in chapter 14. Uh, 13, and now even in 14, he concludes saying, if I, I don't know what I did, if God could reveal it to me, then that would be fine, but he hasn't yet, because I don't know what it is. I pray that God would take away my suffering by taking away my life. He's saying, basically, if I have done wrong, then let me be punished, but let me at least know what I did wrong. All right, let's go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, so Paul continues now in this, in this letter of correction. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in, in fear, and in, in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were, were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, on, on his ability to speak, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the among ba, 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 ha. We do, however, speak wisdom or a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom, a wisdom, in a mystery a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the, the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But, as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, 
so that for the purpose of uh, we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. He gets to this later. These are things that are spiritually discerned versus the things that are uh, discerned naturally through the world. We also speak these things, not, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the, the rather taught by the Spirit, uh, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is stupidity. It is foolishness to him. Why would he believe in something so ridiculous, he would think. He is not able to, to understand it since it is evaluated. It is received spiritually. The spiritual person, the one in whom the Spirit of God rests, however, can evaluate everything. And yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone, anyone outside of, of those in the Spirit. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we? We have the mind of Christ. Now this is important because he's about to, to go into information for them. And we're going to see this kind of play out through the rest of this, uh, rest of this letter where he explains that the struggles that they're having are because they're thinking of things in an earthly way. They're misunderstanding these things. So what he's weighing out here is the difference between things that are natural, worldly, earthly. Things that we would naturally believe before we became Christians and those that we now understand to be true now that we are in Christ. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll start on that tomorrow. God willing, behold the word of the Lord.